Hello, my name is Ian Beavout and welcome to my YouTube channel. So today, I thought we would take a look at the 1974 classic, War Child by Jethro Tull. War Child is the seventh Jethro Tull record and was the third record to feature this lineup. That being Ian Anderson, vocals, flute, soprano saxophone, acoustic guitar, as well as handling the songwriting duties. Martin Barr on electric guitar, Jeffrey Hammond on bass, John Evan on piano, keyboard, and accordion, and Barrymore Barlow on drums. This album also features heavy contributions from Dee Palmer, who handled orchestrations from the band. This comes at a rather fascinating point in the band's history. In 1973, they had released an album called A Passion Play, which if you follow my channel, um, you will know that that is one of my favorite records of all time, possibly my favorite record of all time. However, upon the release of A Passion Play, uh, the band were attacked by the press, to say the least, being accused of some of the worst aspects of the so-called progressive rock genre, as in the lofty, unintelligible lyrics and overly complex and dazzling instrumental passages. There was even a brief period where Tall's management announced to the music press that the band had quit and were no longer going to tour, which of course uh, was a complete fabrication. I don't believe they ever intended to go off the road, uh, especially since the Passion Play shows themselves were successful and well-liked by audiences, maybe not so much by critics, but audiences liked those shows. With the War Child album, you see the band um, combining their art rock and progressive tendencies of, say, Thick as a Brick and a Passion Play with the more straightforward character songs that appear on albums like Aqualung. Another thread that runs through this album uh, ties to the abandoned 1972 Chateau de Hurville sessions, which um, happened in between Thick as a Brick and a Passion Play, originally conceived as a double record set with songs dealing with the afterlife as well as um, these metaphorical animal stories, themes which show up in songs like uh, the story of the hare who lost his spectacles, um, as well as uh, songs on this album, such as Sea Lion and Bungle in the Jungle, both of which have lyrical ties to the Chateau de Hurville sessions. However, there are two songs here that were actually recorded in the Chateau de Hurville sessions, those being Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day and the short acoustic Attack on the Critics, Only Solitaire, which somehow feels more relevant after the release of A Passion Play than before. Um, so with this album, uh, we kind of see the conceptual edge of the last couple of records thrown to the wayside and we're back to more thematic material songs like war child and the third hurrah uh seem to be about this uh this fight or flight response in people as well as nurturing your inner child oftentimes um, when people are aggressive, it is the result of some sort of childhood trauma. And I think that this is a thread that specifically runs through the first and penultimate tracks on this album. You also have um, a couple of songs that deal with prostitution, um, such as Ladies and Backdoor Angels, uh, as well as songs that deal with the climate change crisis. Sea Lion, uh, as well as Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day. Whereas now, 
we talk more about global warming in 1974, the topic was global cooling. The idea of the earth being distilled to ice. You know how in a passion play, uh, it's um, the, the play is a metaphor for life. Well, here I feel like, especially in songs like Sea Lion, it's more like the circus is now a metaphor for life, particularly for these gentlemen in the entertainment industry who may have at this point sort of felt like performing seals. You also have one song which dates back to the Aqualung era, namely Two Fingers, which was originally recorded in 1971 under the title Lick Your Fingers Clean. That was a much more hard rock, perhaps even early punk song, whereas this feels more like, again, a combination of the art rock stylings of Thick as a Brick and a Passion Play with the more straightforward hard rock style of Aqualung. So I think that that's the strength of this album, getting away from these side length epics. Back to self-contained songs that are under five minutes long and uh, kind of say what needs to be said and get out and move on. I think that that was something that kind of set a precedent for the rest of Jethro Tull's career, especially Ian Anderson's songwriting. Aside from a song like Baker Street Muse, which was on um, Minstrel in the Gallery, the follow-up record, they didn't really do the side-length epic thing after this. Musically, it's quite a diverse album, and it may even be too diverse for some people at first. Um, you do have this Elizabethan thread that runs through it, especially with songs like Queen and Country, um, which have the emergence of the squeezy thing, John Evan on the accordion. Um, and it also has a kind of a combination of, once again, that theme of exploration, of going to foreign lands in search of riches. And to me, this again feels like a commentary on a touring live band. I would definitely point to a song like Backdoor Angels as being one of the strongest songs on the album. At its essence, it is a song, but in the middle, I think you get a little taste of what Jethro Tull were like live with their slightly more expansive jammy tendencies. Sea Lion is a song to me that would not be out of place on the Chateau de Herville sessions or even the Passion Play album with its saxophone-led uh, riff. Then you have an all-time classic, which is Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day. I mentioned earlier, this is a climate change song, um, but this is a return to something I think that Tall is one of the best at, and that is the acoustic dynamic. We hear this on Thick as a Brick. We hear this on Stand Up with songs like Fat Man. You also have Bungle in the Jungle, which was uh, played to death on the radio to the point that many people hate it. I actually don't hate it. I don't agree with Ian Anderson, who finds the song too sing-songy uh, and finds the chorus too catchy. I actually think this is a rather strong song. The third hurrah sees Tall embracing Beethoven. Uh, particularly something like Beethoven's Ninth, which um, they would go on to perform. This is one of the most textured songs on the album with brilliant orchestrations from Dee Palmer. Surprisingly for a tall record, you hear bagpipes, which is something you don't hear that often. This is a fantastic record. It's It sits kind of between the eras. Um, we are kind of post prog era, moving into the more folky area. I do think there was an attempt to recapture some of the glory of Aqualung, um, but I think that this album allows enough of the weirdness in to uh, make it something that I really enjoy just for how unique it is. The strong songwriting aside, I think this is one of the more unique Tall records. So now that we've talked about the album and some of the themes as well as some of the background and uh, the songs. 
let's talk about the 40th anniversary theater edition, which is about to be reissued before the end of the month. I think overall, this is one of Stephen Wilson's strongest remixes. And I think that he managed to keep a lot of the dynamics of this album while adding such great clarity. And again, this is one of the most textured Jethro Tall records with a lot of non-traditional instrumentation coming in and a lot of influences flowing throughout the whole thing. And it does have a very theatrical presentation to the surround mix. You hear this within the first few moments of the record with uh, the sound effect of apparently the tea lady, uh, the studio tea lady, asking Ian Anderson if he'd like some tea. And uh, you hear what sounds like shots being fired, uh, kind of floating all around the room. I think that Skating Away on the Thin Ice of a New Day is always amazing in surround sound because of all the discrete little percussion overdubs and marimba tracks. But I would also point to a song like The Third Hurrah, uh, which has, again, the bagpipes and the orchestrations. You know, there's always this risk when you have something so thoroughly arranged that it could be overkill. It could be too much. And I think that Wilson's mix really balances this and it never feels overbearing. Not, none of the extra instrumentation uh, ever feels like it's getting in the way of the songs. You also have one of the most fascinating outtakes discs in the entire Jethro Tull canon. In addition to some great band songs, Paradise Steakhouse, uh, Saturation, uh, Glory Row, and Rainbow Blues, uh, the latter of two were released back in the 70s and are worthy of any tall record. You also have a couple of previously unreleased tracks that are only available on this collection, as well as the War Child 2 LP release, which came out a few years ago for Record Store Day. These songs are Good Godmother, which uh, kind of paints a psycho-esque Norman Bates-style character. But you also have another song which dates back to the Aqualung sessions, which as a Tall fan was a song that I wanted to hear a studio version of for a long time, particularly because it was played live. And that was Tomorrow Was Today. It's really cool to hear these tunes uh, for the first time all these decades later. And uh, one of the main reasons I think to get this collection is not only Stephen Wilson's excellent remix, but also some unique material. The entire second half of the outtakes disc is taken up by uh, D. Palmer's soundtrack music that until this reissue came out in 2014, most of which had never been heard. There was a little snippet of it on the 2002 remaster, uh, but this is the first time that a lot of this material has been released. The movie would have starred John Cleese as God and basically had been a dramatization of the A Passion Play story, except that instead of Ronnie Pil Pilgrim dies and has experiences in the afterlife, it's a young girl, it's a child who dies. And by the way, it would have been a comedy. <laughs> uh, so you have Jethro Tull doing the rock and roll movie before Pink Floyd, possibly at the same time as The Who. I think this would have been a little bit before Tommy, um, or at least around the same time. The one track that I thought I would highlight is um, Mime Sequence, which was co-written by guitarist Martin Barr and features Martin playing nylon string acoustic, which is lovely to hear, especially with the orchestral timbres. Is this material something that I revisit often? Um, no, it really isn't. Uh, and I have to say that that's because rock music is more my thing. I'm not that huge a fan of classical music. It's not something I really love. But if you're interested in Jethro Tull of this period, I think it's a worthwhile listen. And, you know, Palmer's orchestrations are lush and gorgeous, and you can't go wrong with them, especially translated into 5.1 surround sound. I think that um, 
classical music really does work for the format. All right. Uh, I think that wraps up just about everything I wanted to say. Don't forget that if you enjoyed this video to leave it a like. Also, the comment section is available to you below to give me your reaction. Um, what is your favorite song on War Child? Do you think you'll be picking this collection up? Let me know in the comments. Also, uh, if you enjoyed this and my other Jethro Tall content, you might consider subscribing to the channel because next I will be covering the Heavy Horses album, which is one of my favorites. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, last thing to say is that if you would like to make a donation to the channel, uh, I have included a link to my Amazon wish list in the description. So if you are able and willing, you can check that out and perhaps send me something in to talk about. All right, that's it for me for today. My name's Ian Beabout, and you will hear from me really soon. Bye-bye.